So primary structure of a protein is just the order of the amino acids held together by those peptide links, by those covalent bonds. Secondary structure is how in different parts of the protein, maybe those amino acids will arrange themselves in an alpha helix, hydrogen bonding every fourth residue, or maybe it'll arrange itself in a chain of the residues going along that then comes back on itself so that the second part of the chain interacts and hydrogen bonds with the first part of the chain and so on. OK, and so we describe different bits of the same protein in terms of the local 3D secondary structure. Well, obviously, we've had primary, secondary. The next one's going to be the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is effectively the whole protein. OK, what is the overall shape of this big peptide chain as it goes through? Now, what you find is that uh, by and large proteins can be globular, as we're obviously showing here. That's a great big glob of amino acids, or they could be fibrous. In other words, they are just made up of uh, strands of the protein together. Obviously, globular, you can see you're going to have lots of um, alpha helices and some beta sheets that I'll show you in a minute. Fibrous ones more arrange themselves sort of in a lengthwise fashion. Now the interactions that hold the tertiary structure together are all different types of intermolecular forces. We think of here's one part of the protein, that's another big part of the protein. Well, we can, of course, have hydrogen bonds. So here's, for example, a OH residue, that's the acid residue of another part, for example, all types of hydrogen bonding you can think of. That's one example in which one part of the chain interacts with another part of the chain holding it together. You can have dispersion forces or hydrophobic interactions. Remember, they say a lot of the amino acids in which the R groups um, are essentially hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons can interact with each other very weakly with dispersion forces or otherwise known as hydrophobic forces. Now, those are extremely important in holding together the tertiary and, as we'll see in a minute, the quaternary structures, simply because there's so many of them. OK, so indeed, Probably the most important factor holding together the tertiary structures is the, the aggregation and the agglomeration of the hydrophobic residues towards the middle of this glob of globular protein holding it together. Now, I mentioned earlier something special about cysteine. You can have these nice disulfide bridges holding one cysteine residue to another cysteine residue. Now, obviously, this is a covalent bond, so it's nice and strong. And so whatever parts of the tertiary structure are held together by these disulfide bridges, rather more tightly held together than these other ones. OK, disulfide bridges are relatively rare even though they, they form a big part of the textbook descriptions of tertiary structures. And then the last type of intermolecular force, one of the best ones, ionic parts. Remember, you've got charged things all over the place in amino acids. So here is a positive um, conjugate acid of an amine group interacting quite nicely with the negative charge associated with the conjugate base of a carboxylic group. And of course, these will be the side chain acids and amines much more often than not. So tertiary structures in which just the local things are held together. And if we look at a picture of a glucokinase and these sort of ribbon type things are um, the way that a lot of times structures of proteins will be um, described because there's just too many atoms to draw them all. But you can see this little alpha helix as part of the molecule. You can see some beta sheets. You can see all these nice little turns that go from here, for example, an alpha helix going into a beta sheet there. So you can see how the alpha and the beta sheet secondary structures can come together to give you, in this case, a nice globular protein and that tertiary structure held together by a combination of all of these types of interparticle forces. So primary order of the amino acid residues. These come together in the um, local direction or local part so that they can form helices and sheets. You put all those helices and sheets together to give you the tertiary structure. And then an awful lot of proteins have a quaternary structure. That is where you have 
multiple of these subunits held together. And again, these are held together with intermolecular forces, with those hydrophobic forces being the most important. Now, these are pretty structures. I'm just going to show you a couple more pretty structures just to show you how it all holds together in the quaternary. And then we're done. Primary for chemists, the most important. Secondary and tertiary, really cool in terms of how hydrogen bonds and then these other intermolecular forces, interparticle forces go together to define extremely complicated structures. Quaternary, indeed, I found some A level notes in which they say, yeah, chemists just go for these ones, it's only biologists who care about the quaternary. But of course, the quaternary structure is ultimately how you have to study the proteins. So pretty little picture of hemoglobin. There are four bits to hemoglobin. So it is a tetramer of proteins, the blue there, the red, the sort of kind of pinky thing, and then the other blues, these indicating further away from you. So a nice little picture taken from the protein data bank of human hemoglobin, showing you just how the four units come together. So like I say, just uh, not even scratching the surface of proteins, but hopefully it's given you an idea of the fun and the beauty of protein structures.